Well, I don't know what heaven's going to look like, but I'm going to, I know I'm going to be there. And uh, I think the, the feet of Jesus is going to be a pretty crowded place. Amen. I think uh, we might have to, I, I, I love the song, I, I Could Only Imagine, because none of us uh, really know what it's going to be like, but we can't imagine, can't we? And uh, I do know one thing, uh, I'm going to be looking at him face to face one day, and what a day, what a glorious day that's going to be. Take your Bibles. Look to Genesis 18, would you please? Open to eight, Genesis 18. We um, have been in a series called Faith and Blessings. And um, I want to uh, uh, share with you, I think one of the, today, one of the greatest blessings God's ever given us. Think about that. What, one of the greatest blessings God's ever given us. Now, your mind's probably scrolling through and thinking about what that could be. Uh, of all those things, we got forgiveness of sin. That's pretty good. Amen? I mean, how many of you like to be forgiven? No matter what you've done, you're forgiven. No matter how stupid you have been, you're forgiven. I think us husbands, we need a stupid card. Because every now and again, we need to look it over and give it to our wives and say, you have to forgive me. I was just stupid, right? There are things that we just go through and we just go through life and we're just grateful for. I'm grateful for a nice, cool morning. Isn't it nice out there? I've been looking forward to this for a while. I've always said if I had my thermostat where I could set my own. When we get to heaven, I hope we get our own thermostat. Because if I'm in the same heaven with some of y'all, I'm going to burn up. Amen. And for some of y'all, I'm going to freeze to death too. So I get my own thermostat. But if I had my own thermostat, it'd be kind of cool like this morning. Not too hot this afternoon. Wouldn't that be good? I didn't get one amen. I got a few shakes of the heads, but I didn't get one amen. But today I'm going to talk about friends. How many of you are grateful for friends? Amen. How many of you are grateful God gave us that great gift of friends? You know, life is sweet because we have people that we do life together. People that, that are, they just uh, make us smile and it's just a glorious thing. So I want you to do right now, if you would, just stop and I want you to start thinking of some of your friends. Now you probably turned to family pretty quick, but let's go beyond family. I mean, you can't choose family, but you can choose your friends, right? How many of those friends have you had for a pretty good while? How many of those friends have you been really through some stuff? There's a term I heard that I really like this term. It's called the two o'clock friend. At 2 a.m. in the morning, if you needed to call somebody, do you have somebody you could call? That's who your two o'clock friend is. How many of you, if you called that person, they'd hang up on you? Come on now, you know some of them, they'd say, what? Do you know what time it is? But aren't you grateful for the friends that could care less what time it is? They're going to get up and they're going, you wouldn't call at 2 o'clock in the morning unless it was important, right? Right? So you got somebody who puts you above themselves, and that is a great and awesome thing. Now, where do friends come from? Well, I don't really know. They come from all over the place. Sometimes it's just proximity. I remember uh, in elementary school, I just sat by this kid. You know, the teachers gave us assigned seats. How many of y'all got assigned seats? And I was sitting there right by, and you know, some teachers, it was alphabetical order, and you got the same friend all the time. But sometimes they mixed them up, and I was right there, and he became my friend through elementary school until we, uh, my dad, you know, we moved, and and I had to go to new school. And, you know, then I found it kind of hard to meet friends. Matter of fact, on Facebook this week, one of uh, my, my high school friends put, put, uh, put something on there that they have been friends with all this group of people since the fourth grade. I'm like, no, I knew you from the fifth grade on, but I didn't know you. But or, I said fourth grade, four years old. It was a four-year-old kindergarten. And she's like, don't you know all those folks? I'm like, no, I don't. I, no, that's so-and-so and that's so-and-so. I say, it don't look like them. I mean, maybe a little bit or something. I don't know like that. But some of those friends we just get by proximity. Some of them we just have common interests, sports, music, hobbies, you know, just things that we like to do together, hunting, you know, old cars, whatever those things are, sewing. And people, pe people just, have you heard the phrase birds of a feather flock together? But sometimes those, those birds just fly on by and you find somebody else that you want to flock with for a little while. And, and that's kind of how it goes. And, and 
In Scripture, we understand that there are two words that really describe friends, though it's, it's hardly ever defined as the word friend in the Bible. One of them is called phileo. And phileo is, obviously, obviously you've heard this before. I know this is my New Holland folks, but, but it's, it means brotherly love. It expresses a love or a care, a concern, uh, an affection that you have someone, and we, they use this term brotherly love. And it's usually because, listen, you've got a common interest. There's something that brought you together, and, and you like to do those things together. You like to go to the Braves games together. You like to go uh, to shopping together, right? You can go with my wife. You, you, you like to do all the, you like to go to eat out sometimes and see friends. I, uh, Friday night, I, I saw some church members and uh, we were on date night, you know, and uh, saw them there. And they, so I got testimony. I do take my wife out on Friday night, date night, right? And they were just out with friends, you know, and they just things that they enjoy doing. Understand that <clears throat> phileo means you have a common interest. You get along with people because you have something in common with them. But the problem with phileo is this. Usually phileo is because it brings you pleasure. But if it ceases to bring you pleasure, it ceases to be a friendship or love. Have you ever fought with a friend? Now, sometimes... Two kids in the playground in elementary school can be fussing and fighting and busting each other's nose and they become best friends. But sometimes later on in life, two people who've done everything together, they get in a spit and a spat about something and then they don't want to talk to each other ever more. They, don't, they want to ignore each other. That's phileo. Phileo. That's, it, 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 it's your friendship that is there, but it's, it, it's like hot and cold water. You can turn it on and you can turn it off. Obviously, you know the other word is agape. And agape is that word means I see someone, I know someone, and, and I care for them. But this is the thing about it. It takes it to another level where I value them. Not only do I value them, I cherish them. And hear this, this is a friendship, this is a caring and concern and a love that places that person above you. That circumstances are not going to break it apart. You'll go through circumstances. This is your two o'clock friend. This is the one that cares for you, that knows all your junk and still loves you. Come on now. Instead of breaking the relationship because of your junk, they're there for you in spite of your junk. That's the one that we really need. And, and I started thinking about this. I said, well, you know, what kind of friends are we to other people? To, to have a friend, you have to be friendly, right? Do we have those friends that we can wake up? L let me ask you. Do, if you have five friends that you could wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they wouldn't blink an eye, and they'd be there for you no matter what, even if you were in another state, do you have, the, do you have five of those? If you do, you are an unbelievably rich person. Unbelievably blessed. When I started thinking about this, I, I, I wanted to put down some of the traits of what I thought a friend were. So this is not Brian's list, but I looked them up and I, I kind of amended it. So let's go through these real quickly. Number one, a friend should be trustworthy. You should be able to trust them. Does that make sense? Honest. You want somebody, if they're your friends, you want them to be able to tell you the truth. And you want them to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Honest. Dependable. You want to be able to, if they say something, you want to know that they're going to do it no matter what. Loyal. You don't want the phileo friend that's going to, if, if everything suits them, they'll love you. But if it doesn't suit them, they're going to discard you like trash. You want somebody that'll be loyal to you. Believes in you. Now, look up here. Of all the things that are on this list, I'm not sure which one will really bless you to the core as much as this one. Somebody that believes in you. Somebody that, that knows you and yet thinks good of you. That thinks that, that, that you are all right and that you can be successful and, and you can do well. Someone that expresses empathy towards you that knows your hurts and concerns, and, and when you cry, they cry. 
understands your flaws without critiquing or criticizing your flaws. There is, I don't know what you call it, it's not friend, but those people around you that are so negative and they always bring up the worst flaw, I mean, they can't forget it. It's in their head because that, that's the thing that's important to them. And, and it just, it just, it's like a magnet. They're, they're, that's not the people that you want to be around. Those people don't encourage you, right? You want a friend that's a good listener. A good listener. Sometimes they just need to keep their mouth shut and listen. Somebody that's supportive. Good times and bad times. But they're supportive. And then I made sure this one was on the list. Y'all look at me. Somebody that's fun to be around. You want to have a best friend that's not fun to be around? Can I tell you God gave us a sense of humor? And I haven't worn mine out yet. I've tried, but I'm, I'm still trying to. I love a sense of humor. I don't want to be around sourpuss. Do you? Those people who eat briars for breakfast, God help you. It may be good fiber, but it's not good living, right? Somebody that's fun and, and, and can laugh with you and can joke with you and, and, and you do those things that are common together. Those are wonderful things and it's a good thing to have friends. It's a God thing to have friends. Now, don't turn to, I want you to stay in Genesis 18, but let me read to you a, a verse from 2 Chronicles chapter number 20, verse number 7. God's word says this. When he's speaking to the children of Israel, he says, Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham? Listen to this now. Your friend forever. Hold on, I'm going to put my finger here. And I'm going to go to the New Testament, to the book of James. And I want you to hear what James chapter 2, verse 23 says. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We read that when we got to Genesis 15. Abraham believed in God, trusted God, and that became God's imputed righteousness. When he believed, God saved him. All right? But then listen to the last part of that verse. And he was called the friend of God. He was called the friend of God. Now, when you look at these two together... And you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, it's saying that Abraham was God's friend. But when you look in James chapter 2, he was saying that God was Abraham's friend. Did y'all catch that? I can't tell you how many times I read past both of those, and just because I saw the similarity in my mind, I just flew past it. But really, when you look at it, to God looked down at Abraham and said, that's my friend. And Abraham could do the same thing. Abraham could walk through life, and the friend that stick closer than a brother was the almighty God, the creator of the universe. The one who knows all, who's most powerful, who is love, who is always love, who is always good and kind and patient and, and long-suffering. So when I think of this list, trustworthy, is God trustworthy? Amen. Is he honest? He can't be anything but honest. Is he dependable? Sure, you can depend on him. I've always been bewildered by people who say that they're saved, so they're, be, they're depending on God to get them to heaven one day, but they can't be, depend on him for a bill that they need to pay or, or a situation in life, and they're so nervous. And if, if you, is he dependable? Yes. Is he loyal? Oh, my goodness, he's loyal. He's my father. He's my father. Does, he believes in me. My greatest cheerleader is Jesus Christ. He understands my flaws, and yet he's my cheerleader, and he shows empathy. God's heart breaks when my heart breaks. I love this passage. When he's talking about the children of Israel and slavery in Egypt, right? He says that he sent the deliverer Moses because he heard their cries. Do you know that he hears your cries? When no one else does. Though you may have been talking about your pains and your sufferings with others, it doesn't seem like they're listening. God is. He's a great listener. He's always supportive, no matter what. And I don't know about the God that you serve, but the God I serve is fun to be around. He's a great God. 
He's a good, good father like we sang about this morning. So when I think about these, I want you to think of the type of friend that you are to God. Hopefully you know the type of friend that God is to you. Take your Bible and look in Genesis chapter 18. I'm not going to ask you to stand in reading of God's word because we're just going to kind of go verse by verse down through it. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Let's read the first two verses. Then the Lord appeared to him by the timbereth tree of Mamre. He was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. Hot of the day, he's probably been working. He comes back by the tent. There's a flap over the front door of the tent that is there. He's a little bit in the shade, trying to find a little shade, trying to find just a little bit of, uh, of coolness that is there. And he looks up and he sees these three people and he immediately knows who this one is. I love this fact. Get this, nobody had to introduce him. This is called a theophany. This is an Old Testament representation of when Jesus shows up. Now, I don't know why, other than Jesus said, let's go be with Abraham. Should we call him? No, no, let's just show up at his house. You ever had those people that knock on the door and you're like, you're frozen. Who could that be? We used to know that was the Jehovah Witnesses. Praise God for their, uh, their testimony. You know, it, they never said, hey, that's the Baptist. No, but they said it was the Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses. But, but you, he looks up and he knows who they are immediately. It's Jesus Christ and two angels, two of his special people. And they come represented as man. And they're there. And when he sees them, he's excited. And he runs to them. And he doesn't give them the big bear hug. Because he knows who they are and because he knows who he is, he approached them by falling on his face before him. What a wonderful way to come before God in worship. That's what the word means, to bow down. Now that can be physically or that can be emotionally, but let it be that our pride is taken out of the way and we humble ourselves and we give him praise and glory and honor for the God that he is and worship him in spirit and in truth. In joy and in peace, he's there. Glad to see him. I wonder, here's Jesus and he shows up and as soon as Abraham sees him, he runs and he falls on his feet before him. And don't you know that that just put a smile on, on God's face? Couldn't we do the same thing? In the simplicity of everything that we do, the attitude of our day when we run to God and worship, Look what it says in verse 3. And said, my Lord, if I now have found favor in your sight, he knows that he has, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts, that you may pass by in so much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. You know what he's looking for? He just wants to spend some time together with him. Some fellowship. Can I bring you some water to cool your feet, wash your feet, be refreshed a little bit? Can, can we just spend some time together? Can, can, I, can I cook a meal for you? When I was growing up, we had hospitality. We had a lot of people come to our house. My, that's the way my parents were. So it was a very common thing for people to come by our house. But you were not going to come to my house without my mama feeding you. If I had friends, and by the way, we had a gang in the neighborhood. How many of y'all had a gang that you grew up with? And, and there was like, uh, well, probably 20 of us. And, and at any point in time, seeing five of us together was a normal thing, right? And, and they were all welcome in our house. And if you came by, we would run in and mama would make us something, get us something to eat and get us something to drink. And, and she always made sure there was something for us. Just hospitality, wanting to spend time together. How many of you get too busy for God? All right, this is an oh me moment for all of us. 
How many of us rush through the time with God? How many, how many of us rush through the time in prayer? Can I confess to you? There, was t- there, was, there have been times in my life that I would get down on my knees, on my knees. You can tell it was when I was younger. I got down on my knees this morning, but I didn't stay as long. But there were times that I would spend between an hour and two hours in prayer on my knees. I don't do this so much anymore. Brother Gary and I prayed together this week. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a whole lot easier walking than I, and I, than I am on my knees. But whether you're on your knees praying or walking praying or driving praying, or how f- quickly does your mind go away? but your friend you want to spend time with. And yes, I know that you don't have to be on your knees. You don't even have to voice it. You can say it in your heart. But God's attentive. And God wants to spend that time there. Do we want to spend fellowship time with him? Well, Abraham did. So they said, sure, go ahead and do it. Verse number six. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make three measures of fine meal, fine meal. Need it make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a tender, good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. He took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Doesn't say Abraham ate. It was a gift unto the Lord. Y'all listen. What was the last gift you gave unto the Lord? You don't even think about it, do you? This is the one who gives all. What was the last gift you gave him? Now, please understand this. Our heart was made to melt with his. That's how he created us. And we take that so for granted. And when I think of this, I get so convicted because we're so busy doing all the things that we do. When was the last time you brought something? You, you know, if you have a friend, you know, Cheryl Wigley brought me something one day. It was a towel that said, and all God's people, and all God's people said, go dogs. It's football season. We ought to be able to say that. Amen. She just saw it. When she saw it, she thought about me and bought it and brought it to me. And to that, I say, amen. That's a friend, right? When was the last time you, you just thought of God and said, this is what I want to do for God? For nothing in return, I want to do for God. When do we do things with a hook when it's about us? When do we do things just absolutely out of love? Husbands, we'll buy flowers for our wife. We'll buy a gift for them. We'll, we'll do all kinds of things for them because we love them. But we say that we love God, and we just expect from God without ever having a thought of giving to God. Well, look in verse 9. Then they said to him, where is Sarah your wife? Hospitality. He said, here in the tent. He said, I will certainly, certainly, you can depend on me. I'll be back next year. I'll return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Now, hold on. It had been promised. Sarah's in the tent. She's listening at the door. We'll be back next year, same time. And your wife will have the child. Your child, Abraham. Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him, and Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. We'll be back. Let's listen to verse 12. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? I think this is um, cool, listen to this. Both laughed with pleasure. Abraham laughed with pleasure because of being in the presence of God when he, he ran to them, eager to be there. Sarah laughed, but it was because of unbelief. Both laughed. 
One laughed because they wanted to be in the presence of God. The other laughed and said, it could not be. Unbelief. Ha! I'm going to have a child. <laughs> yeah, right. Listen to God's response. Verse 13. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I bear a child since I am old? I've been promising this. Yes, I know you've been promising this. But now I'm 89. And you want me to have a child? I'm 89. Come on, God. No, can't be. Listen to God's response, verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? We would answer quickly that and say no. But yet we wonder all along. We don't think that, we don't wonder if it's too much for God. We just don't know if God would do it for us. I mean, God can make the world stand still. God can make the sun set in the sky. He's proven it in Scripture. We know that. He's not worried about the Jerichos of the world. Walk around, the, walk around it seven times. Clap your hands. Take a step back. Blow the trumpet and the walls will come to There is no obstacle. There is no mountain that can't be picked up and thrown into the sea. There is nothing that God would not do for you. Let me ask you, parent, is there anything that you would look at your child in need, in love, and say, no, I'm not willing, I'm able, but I'm not willing to do it? Not our good, good father. It brings him pleasure to bring us pleasure. Y'all hear me? He wants to be there for us. He's a whisper away. Whether you think anybody's or not, when I'm preaching this morning, I have God's undivided attention. There, there are, they tell us there are 7 billion people on the planet, but God cares about every thought in my life, every action. What I'm, to, what I'm doing today, I'm seeking to do to honor him. I say this all the time. I serve the Lord at his pleasure. That means if he wants me to, I will. But I want to bring him pleasure. There's nothing that God can't do. He's that kind of a friend for me. He is there for me. The question is, are we there for him? What kind of friend are we to God? To have a friend, you must first be what? Friendly. To know God in this way, you've got to open up your own life to be with God in this way. Do you have the faith in God to walk with him? I love in the New Testament when it's describing the Christian life, he, he calls it the walk. I love that. What has God done for you? No, nobody has blessed me like God has. Nothing can come close to the peace that I have in my heart that makes all the noise of the world go away. When the world is upset and they don't know what to do, God brings tranquility. I love it in the early mornings when you go out to a lake or something like that and it looks like a sheet of glass. Peace. I love it when it says in Psalms 23, he leads me beside the still waters. I love the joy. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. Oh, how he's blessed me. Oh, how he's been there for me. In my work, worst of times, when others have walked away, God never walked away. He encourages my heart. When I think of, y'all might not know this, but your pastor's a sinner. I mean, you, you may think that I, I, I got this thing together. Matter of fact, I am such a sinner that I do it every day. 
Matter of fact, I do it all day, every day. And there's things that I know that I'm not supposed to do. My thoughts go there anyway. Any of y'all ever get angry? I don't know. Not y'all. Frustrated? Never. I know. I know y'all. Never. You go through things and there's difficulties and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and you, you know that every, you just always act perfectly. You never have a, a harsh feeling towards anyone else. You never murmur a, a negative word towards someone else. You never think in, in your mind, you just want to tell them to shut up. You, y'all don't ever do that. Y'all, y'all don't ever grow frustrated. Y'all aren't weak. Y'all are always praying. Y'all are always being kind. And y'all are always going out and, and being treating everyone else the way you would want to be treated. But see, I'm not that way. And here's the deal. God knows that about me and God loves me and, and chases after me. Do you have friends that call you up? Hey, let's go do something. That's my Lord. He wants to meet every morning, Margaret. He wants to be with us there. (laughs) In the simplest of things that I have grown to learn to ignore that I should not ignore. I went out to the truck to do a couple things before I came in. When I did, this big, old, beautiful, fat bird came and flew up and sat right there. And I'm looking at it. And he flutters around and comes back around and looks at him. And I'm like, God, you did an absolutely beautiful job with that bird. And then you know what my mind went to? My mind went to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, I got this bird. I take care of this bird. This bird needs nothing. I feed it. I clothe it. I do everything for it. Can I do the same thing for you? And something welled up within me of thanksgiving in my heart. Ask, and you shall receive. Is there anything too hard for God? Seek, and you shall find. That sounds kind of like a promise. Knock, and the door shall be opened. Is there a parent that would not give their child bread, but give them a stone? Is that the kind of God that we have? Is that the kind of friend that we have? We used to sing a song. What a friend we have in Jesus. And in our heart, You know, love that's not spoken, is it really love? Love that is not expressed? If we truly love, if we truly see him as our friend, not some God who's way off, but is close, I'm going to say this and I'm going to pray. Yes, when Abraham ran and fell at his feet, I believe that he put a smile on God's face. Now, I know God smiles when he looks at me. (laughs) That's because he's God. But I want to live my day in such a way to put a smile on his face. That friend that I saw on date night, the lady came around to our table and said, "Uh, your bill has been taken care of. They slipped out, those sneaky little people. I'm not telling you who they are. But they snuck out and they paid my bill. All we had to do was go on. And you know what I thought? Wow, I don't deserve that. But I felt mighty good that they felt enough of us to do that. Probably because of Lynn, right, man? What kind of a friend are we to Jesus? Let's bow our heads. Lord, we do love you.
Help us to learn how to love you more. Father, you are patient, long-suffering, and kind. I know that. But Lord, I pray that we would linger more in prayer. That we would hunger for more for obedience. That our heart would break for that which breaks yours. Lord, that we would want to know you. Spend time with you. And Lord, not just say it, but do it. And not wait for tomorrow, but do it today. Father, I apologize for taking you for granted. Because I know that you will be there for me. And I know that you're watching and listening. And you are a good, good father. But Lord, I shouldn't treat you that way. And Lord, I serve at your pleasure. But I pray that the way that I serve brings you pleasure. Father, help New Holland to be a friendly church. But Lord, so that we could be a friend of yours, so that we could be a friend of those that you love in this world. Change us, oh God. Lord, all the areas in our life that are not the way they need to be, may we make up our mind to see those and determine that today we are going to give those things into you. Father, bless this time of invitation for anyone here that does not know you, anyone that's watching online. You're not their God. You're not their Savior because they haven't chosen to allow you to do that. May they repent of their sins and ask you to come into their life and save them. May they decide today to be a follower of Christ. Lord, help us. Bless this invitation as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.